Hello and welcome. My name is Mark Blatstein, the physician founder of Physician Pre-Sentence Report Service. Today I'm going to share with you a video from Admiral McRaven on his 10 lessons that are life lessons that are a useful strategy for all of us to follow. And whether we're facing the indictment, which is terrifying, at least it was for me, and I think it is for most of us, um, this applies to whether we're going into prison or, quite frankly, if you're going to be a SEAL, because this is a speech that he gives to uh, motivation classes, but it comes from his training. And I guess it goes back probably to SEAL Team 6. But I found it very informative, and I thought it would be helpful because it was helpful to me. So I'm going to go through his 10 lessons, and that is I'm not doing justice to what, how he presents, then I'm going to turn it over to his video. So he starts with that you want to start the day with a task completed, and as silly as it sounds, it starts with making your bed. And how that relates to us is you don't want to depend on the correction staff for support. They're there, they're doing their job. Some people... They're human beings. Some are going to be nice. Some are not going to be nice. They see persons like ourselves, justice impacted inmates, what have you, coming and going all the time. But if you've worked with someone who has helped you to mitigate your sentence, worked with you to prepare your written personal narrative, your release plan, then you know that you have a plan entering and you're going to plan your work once you're in there. Just want to keep your head down and just concentrate on you. Um, your sentence can be long. I mean, you can wind up with a, you know, a 40 to 50 month sentence and you could wind up cutting several years off that just by going ahead and minding your own business, staying out of trouble and doing the work that's, that is we've set out for all of you to do. Second slide. See if I can do it this way. Find someone to help you through life. We all need someone to help us through lives. In this particular case, and again, this sounds obvious, but it's not. You need a federal criminal defense attorney who has experience in federal criminal court with cases similar to yours. I bring this up because, I mean, I've had a client that came from overseas. It was military. And he wound up with a personal injury attorney in another state you know, for a federal defense. And the case had started, I guess, in 2018, 2019. And I did not meet him until 2022, 2023. And so it's, it was a lot of inexperience that led him down a path that I tried my darnest to help him at least get the best possible result. And ironically, I spoke to him this is September 2023, and I spoke to him about a week ago, and he actually got out early. You may need someone familiar with federal prison and how things, you know, how it works. What are you going to do when you get in there? What's prison life like? What are you going to need to do to, to be able possibly, no guarantees, to qualify for an earlier release date? It's possible, but it just doesn't happen overnight. Respect everyone. That goes without saying, because once you've lost all your freedoms, really all you have left in there is respect. So that really becomes a noun and an adjective at the same time. But you want to become friends with those who have shared interests. You don't want to get in trouble. You don't want to wind up getting disciplined. If, if you're lonely and somebody offers you a cell phone to call home innocently, don't do it. <clears throat> Eventually, the cell phones get found. And if your phone number that's on your phone list is on that tel telephone and you've taken the ERDAP program and got a year off your sentence, well, guess what? You may get another charge and you may lose that year. So yes, it is that serious. You don't want to get disciplined. You just you want to, whatever you, you get a job, do your job. Don't pay someone else to do your job. And to be doing something constructive every day. Yes, you're going to take the classes the, that you're offered first step back classes, but what are you going to do if you're taking the classes and six to 10 months later, the case manager who's responsible for you says, you know, 
we have uh, we see that you weren't in this class on this date. How are you going to prove them different? If you kept a running journal or logbook or something that where you noted day, day, time, day, date, time of who taught the class, what you learned, what it was about every day. And so it was in chronological order. You can show them, listen, I was there. And it's it's not like you wrote it in in different, you know, pen or pencil or, you know, you didn't add it, ad lib. It was there and you can show them that this is what you learned. This is what they talked about. I enjoyed the class. Life is not fair, for sure. Um, we've wound up in this particular place as a justice-impacted person. Disappointments in federal prison or any prison, this is just how they operate. They, you know, their their goal is you know not to keep things on a regular routine, and so things will be disappointing to you if. Again, it's September 2023. <clears throat> I mean, the, the Federal Bureau of Prison still doesn't have down pat how everyone is supposed to earn and then get their earn time credits through the first step back to get out early. It just is not, it's not happening the way it's supposed to or right according to policy. But it's not going to do you any good to go in and complain and fight with your case managers and unit team. It just is not. You can, because they can't change the numbers. Um, you can speak with them. You can, but by showing them that you're doing constructive things every day, you're not watching TV, you're doing your job, <clears throat> you're not getting in trouble, you're going to the classes. Maybe you're, if you're smart, maybe you're taking notes on those classes in some sort of journal or logbook. If you have interests, because eventually you're going to get out of prison. Prison is, is finite, as crazy as that sounds. You will get out. And you have other interests. You know, no matter what it may be, philosophy, history, uh, accounting, um, it doesn't matter. You like to paint, whatever it may be. Start reading books on that. And then if there, if there are points in these books that you don't want to forget in an organized logbook, Start making notes and then show this to your case manager as the time goes on. I mean, there's a way to do this, but I'm just giving you some pointers along the way. Don't be afraid to fail. Listen, we all failed because we wound up in prison. Some of us on purpose, some of us not. But the only way to succeed is fail, period. You know, you when you're playing baseball and if you're batting, 500 it's considered great but it just means you miss the ball half the time that's part of life moving forward please don't find yourself constantly complaining to your case manager everyone is complaining they want to go home they didn't like the food whatever it may be don't complain just keep your head down and do the work you've planned the work that you're going to do before you went in you've written your personal narrative you've written your release plan now's the time to implement that if there's a problem, you've also been through the, the administrative remedy process, which is what the Federal Bureau of Prisons encourages you to do. It's for grievances, and it has several steps to it that are that where they strictly adhere to the number of days as you move up the ladder from uh, where you. You notify them, it's called a BP-8, then it goes to BP-9, BP-10, BP-11. So each one, you just can't be late. You have to send them in at the correct time. Sometimes <clears throat> hit life head on. Well, if in fact we've all been indicted, some of us have been in, into prison, out of prison, those of you that are beginning to go into prison, hopefully you know what the personal narrative is. Right now, your narrative has been written by the Department of Justice in the form of your indictment. It probably doesn't seem that great. And so your narrative is your story, your autobiography. It's how you came to this point in your life where you broke the law. And it has to be everything, you know, from childhood experience to today, <clears throat> where you accept responsibility, have remorse for the victims that you've hurt, and how you can attempt to make them whole at some point, because you owe this 
as there is classes in the in the prison system to address your criminogenic needs, that this is how you intend to move forward. And so you have to own the fact that you did the crime. And you have to own it because when you are in at sentencing, the judge is going to ask you if you have anything to say. And this is important. Face down the bullies. If it's an inmate, walk away. If it's BOP staff, apologize for sure. Either way, especially if you're in a BOP, if you're in a minimum camp or a low, you don't want to get in an altercation because they're going to send you to a higher security location or facility or prison. If you're in a medium or a high, you still shouldn't get, I mean, I've met people that have never gotten in any trouble at all. So the idea is just to kind of swallow your pride, walk away, but don't put yourself in that position in the first place. <clears throat> Step up when the times are toughest. Well, by that, I mean, you're going to be disappointed because things are not going to go your way more times than not. You could ever, you could have a visit set up and you expect a loved one to be there and they don't show up. You could have a bad telephone call whatever, with us, someone at home. Whatever it is, the only person that can control your emotions is you. Hope and lift up the downtrodden. He goes, uh, Moore McRaven goes into this in detail, but he refers to Washington, Lincoln, King, Mandela, and even a young Pakistani young lady, Malala. If they could come up through the hardships that they came through, prison's temporary. If they can overcome the obstacles, so can you. Last, never give up. You don't ever want to give up on working towards your goal. Your reentry plan, you've started that before your pre-sentence interview, but then again, you've added to it before your allocution, before the judge, you've added to it before you went into prison, and you've added to it all along. <clears throat> while you've been in there and you've watched it grow. Your case manager, the goal is for you to show it to your case manager and hopefully they acknowledge it and they put it into your file. Listen, there are good people and there are not good people. If they throw it away, swallow your pride and then the next time, try and show it to them again. Um, and, you know, and do that each time. But it will have the, as you're growing, as you're in prison, you're writing down everything you do, every first step back class you, you take. If you're, if you're reading books to learn something on a hobby or learn something on an activity that you enjoy, I don't know, accounting, philosophy, science, whatever it may be, marketing, whatever that may be, real estate, you want to be, be able to keep these books and write down information that you feel you could use later on. This information with someone at home, maybe they set up a blog for you or, or inserted it into a website. But going to a reputation, online reputation building company where they fix your reputation online. When I came home, I thought it would work. I think I spent twelve to $15,000. It did not work. And so as you build your, before you went into your present an interview, you had your narrative written, your personal narrative, your autobiography, your story, you accepted responsibility, you have remorse for the victims that of the pain and the harm that you've done to them. That was included in your pre-sentence report, your re-entry plan is in your pre-sentence report. You then went into prison and your re-entry plan still grew. <clears throat> Even as you are at being, go into halfway house, your re-entry manager is going to review your pre-sentence report, which is going to have in it your narrative. And there's a limited amount of bed space. And so if, if they're looking at two people for one bed and one person has a really good pre-sentence report with a narrative in it and a release plan and the other person does not, who do you think is going to get the bed? Supervised release, same thing with the probation officer. Before they meet you, they're going to profile you a little bit. They're going to need to know who they're going to meet. And eventually you may want to meet come come before your judge to get off supervised release early. And again, they're going to reread everything. I've gone through this 
these are the 10 steps, and I'm sure I did not do, do Admiral Raven justice. So I am going to attempt to add a new share and put into here the video. We'll see if I can get it to work. Changing ourselves and changing the world around us will apply equally to all. So here are the 10 lessons I learned from basic SEAL training that hopefully will be of value to you as you move forward in life. Every morning in SEAL training, my instructors, who at the time were all Vietnam veterans, would show up in my barracks room, and the first thing they'd do was inspect my bed. If you did it right, the corners would be square, the covers would be pulled tight, the pillow centered just under the headboard, and the extra blanket folded neatly at the foot of the rack. It was a simple task, mundane at best, but every morning we were required to make our bed to perfection. That seemed a little ridiculous at the time, particularly in light of the fact that we were aspiring to be real warriors, tough battle-hardened seals. But the wisdom of this simple act has been proven to me many times over. If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride and it will encourage you to do another task and another and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never be able to do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made. <laughs> that you made. And a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. So if you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. During SEAL training, the students during training, the students are all broken down into boat crews. Each crew is seven students, three on each side of a small rubber boat, and one coxswain to help guide the dinghy. Every day, your boat crew forms up on the beach and is instructed to get through the surf zone and paddle several miles down the coast. In the winter, the surf off San Diego can get to be eight to 10 feet high, and it is exceedingly difficult to paddle through the plunging surf unless everyone digs in. Every paddle, must be synchronized to the stroke count of the coxswain. Everyone must exert equal effort or the boat will turn against the wave and be unceremoniously dumped back on the beach. For the boat to make it to its destination, everyone must paddle. You can't change the world alone. You will need some help. And to truly get from your starting point to your destination takes friends, colleagues, the goodwill of strangers, and a strong coxswain to guide you. If you want to change the world, find someone to help you paddle. Over a few weeks of difficult training, my SEAL class, which started with 150 men, was down to just 42. There were now six boat crews of seven men each. I was in the boat with the tall guys, but the best boat crew we had was made up of the little guys, the Munchkin crew, we called them. No one was over five foot five. The Munchkin boat crew had one American Indian, one African American, one Polish American, one Greek American, one Italian American, and two tough kids from the Midwest. They out paddled, out ran, and out swam all the other boat crews. The big men in the other boat crews would always make good natured fun of the tiny little flippers the Munchkins put on their tiny little feet prior to every swim. But somehow these little guys from every corner of the nation and the world always had the last laugh, swimming faster than everyone and reaching the shore long before the rest of us. SEAL training was a great equalizer. Nothing mattered but your will to succeed, not your color, not your ethnic background, not your education, not your social status. If you want to change the world, measure a person by the size of their heart, not by the size of their flippers. Several times a week, the instructors would line up the class and do a uniform inspection. It was exceptionally thorough. Your hat had to be perfectly starched, your uniform immaculately pressed, your belt buckle shiny and void of any smudges. 
But it seemed that no matter how much effort you put into starching your hat or pressing your uniform or polishing your belt buckle, it just wasn't good enough. The instructors would find something wrong. For failing the uniform inspection, the student had to run, fully clothed, into the surf zone, then wet from head to toe, roll around on the beach until every part of your body was covered with sand. The effect was known as a sugar cookie. You stayed in the uniform the rest of the day, cold, wet, and sandy. There were many a student who just couldn't accept the fact that all their efforts were in vain, that no matter how hard they tried to get the uniform right, it went unappreciated. Those students didn't make it through training. Those students didn't understand the purpose of the drill. You were never going to succeed. You were never going to have a perfect uniform. The instructors weren't going to allow it. Sometimes, no matter how well you prepare, or how well you perform, you still end up as a sugar cookie. It's just the way life is sometimes. If you want to change the world, get over being a sugar cookie and keep moving forward. Every day during training, you were challenged with multiple physical events, long runs, long swims, obstacle courses, hours of calisthenics, something designed to test your mettle. Every event had standards, times you had to meet. If you failed to meet those times, those standards, your name was posted on a list, and at the end of the day, those on the list were invited to a circus. A circus was two hours of additional calisthenics designed to wear you down, to break your spirit, to force you to quit. No one wanted a circus. A circus meant that for that day, you didn't measure up. A circus meant more fatigue, and more fatigue meant that the following day would be more difficult and more circuses were likely. But at some time during SEAL training, Everyone, everyone made the circus list. But an interesting, an interesting thing happened to those who were constantly on the list. Over time, those students who did two hours of extra calisthenics got stronger and stronger. The pain of the circuses built inner strength and physical resiliency. Life is filled with circuses. You will fail. You will likely fail often. It will be painful. It will be discouraging. At times, it will test you to your very core. But if you, don't, if you want to change the world, don't be afraid of the circuses. At least twice a week, the trainees were required to run the obstacle course. The obstacle course contained 25 obstacles, including a 10-foot wall, a 30-foot cargo net, a barbed wire crawl, to name a few. But the most challenging obstacle was the slide for life. It had a three-level, 30-foot tower at one end, and a one-level tower at the other. In between was a 200-foot-long rope. You had to climb the three-tiered tower, and once at the top, you grabbed the rope, swung underneath the rope, and pulled yourself hand over hand until you got to the other end. The record for the obstacle course had stood for years when my class began in 1977. The record seemed unbeatable, until one day a student decided to go down the slide for life head first. Instead of swinging his body underneath the rope and inching his way down, he bravely mounted the top of the rope and thrust himself forward. It was a dangerous move, seemingly foolish and fraught with risk. Failure could mean injury and being dropped from the course. Without hesitation, the student slid down the rope perilously fast. Instead of several minutes, it only took him half that time. And by the end of the course, he had broken the record. If you want to change the world, Sometimes you have to slide down the obstacles head first. During the land warfare phase of training, the students are flown out to San Clemente Island, which lies off the coast of San Diego. The waters off San Clemente are a breeding ground for the great white sharks. To pass SEAL training, there are a series of long swims that must be completed. One is the night swim. Before the swim, the instructors joyfully brief the students on all the species of sharks that inhabit the waters off San Clemente. They assure you, however, that no student has ever been eaten by a shark, at least not that they can remember. But you are also taught that if a shark begins to circle your position, stand your ground. Do not swim away. Do not act afraid. And if the shark, hungry for a midnight snack, darts towards you, then summons up all your strength and punch him in the snout, and he will turn and swim away. There are a lot of sharks in the world. If you hope to complete the swim, 
you will have to deal with them. So if you want to change the world, don't back down from the sharks. As Navy SEALs, one of our jobs is to conduct underwater attacks against enemy shipping. We practice this technique ex extensively during training. The ship attack mission is where a pair of SEAL divers is dropped off outside an enemy harbor and then swims well over two miles underwater using nothing but a depth gauge and a compass to get to the target. During the entire swim, even well below the surface, there is some light that comes through. It is comforting to know that there is open water above you. But as you approach the ship, which is tied to a pier, the light begins to fade. The steel structure of the ship blocks the moonlight. It blocks the surrounding street lamps. It blocks all ambient light. To be successful in your mission, you have to swim under the ship and find the keel, the center line, and the deepest part of the ship. This is your objective. But the keel is also the darkest part of the ship, where you cannot see your hand in front of your face, where the noise from the ship's machinery is deafening, and where it gets to be easily disoriented, and you can fail. Every SEAL knows that under the keel, at that darkest moment of the mission, is a time when you need to be calm, when you must be calm, when you must be composed, when all your tactical skills, your physical power, and your inner strength must be brought to bear. If you want to change the world, you must be your very best in the darkest moments. The ninth week of training is referred to as Hell Week. It is six days of no sleep, constant physical and mental harassment, and one special day at the Mud Flats. The Mud Flats are an area between San Diego and Tijuana where the run water runs off and creates the Tijuana Sloughs, a swampy patch of terrain where the mud will engulf you. It is on Wednesday of Hell Week that you paddle down to the Mud Flats and spend the next 15 hours trying to survive the freezing cold, the howling wind, and the incessant pressure to quit from the instructors. As the sun began to set that Wednesday evening, my training class, having committed some egregious infraction of the rules, was ordered into the mud. The mud consumed each man till there was nothing visible but our heads. The instructors told us we could leave the mud if only five men would quit. Only five men, just five men, and we could get out of the oppressive cold. Looking around the mud flat, it was apparent that some students were about to give up. It was still over eight hours till the sun came up. Eight more hours of bone chilling cold. The chattering teeth and the shivering moans of the trainees were so loud, it was hard to hear anything. And then one voice began to echo through the night. One voice raised in song. The song was terribly out of tune, but sung with great enthusiasm. One voice became two and two became three, and before long, everyone in the class was singing. The instructors threatened us with more time in the mud if we kept up the singing, but the singing persisted, and somehow the mud seemed a little warmer, and the wind a little tamer, and the dawn not so far away. If I have learned anything in my time traveling the world, it is the power of hope, the power of one person, a Washington, a Lincoln, King, Mandela, and even a young girl from Pakistan, Malala. One person can change the world by giving people hope. So if you want to change the world, start singing when you're up to your neck in mud. Finally, in SEAL training, there's a bell. A brass bell that hangs in the center of the compound for all the students to see. All you have to do to quit, all you have to do to quit is ring the bell. Ring the bell and you no longer have to wake up at five o'clock. Ring the bell, and you no longer have to be in the freezing cold swims. Ring the bell, and you no longer have to do the runs, the obstacle course, the PT, and you no longer have to endure the hardships of training. All you have to do is ring the bell to get out. If you want to change the world, don't ever, ever ring the bell. It will not be easy. Start each day with a task completed. Find someone to help you through life. Respect everyone. Know that life is not fair and that you will fail often. But if you take some risks, step up when the times are the toughest, face down the bullies, lift up the downtrodden, and never, ever give up. If you do these things, 
The next generation and the generations that follow will live in a world far better than the one we have today. And what started here will indeed have changed the world for the better. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video with me. And I hope that you found this all helpful. I hope you have a safe day. And should you have any questions, please do not feel, hesitate to reach out to me. Again, have a safe day and best wishes.